Narash Anaya. I'm the oldest of four um, and the only girl. So lots of sports growing up, softball and volleyball. 15 years ago, I ran my first 5K and now I have so many 5Ks, um, marathons, ultra marathons, triathlons. Like I kind of just have tackled everything. I'm from Queens originally, and I bought my house a few years ago in Ybor. I ended up finding a community um, that kind of fit my lifestyle. Um, I like being able to walk everywhere I want to. My neighbors all know each other. You know, if something happens to me, they, they're they there. When one of them has a barbecue, they invite my dad and I over. If we can't make it, they bring us a little to-go container. Like, those are the things, the community building aspect, again, you know, all kind of comes back to just like my why. So um, yeah, I you know moved back to Ebor. There's just culture, concerts, everything's in walking distance. I'm 10 minutes away from anything I wanna be, you know, and anywhere I wanna go. December 19th, 2019, one of my friends called and asked if I wanted to go get a beer. He was uh, dog sitting and I have a dog. And so, you know, we figured even though it was pretty chilly night that we would go sit on a patio with the dogs and just, you know, and, and enjoy patio sitting uh, on 7th. I live within walking distance and that is, again, the reason why I bought where I bought. Um, so brought the dog, uh, walked to 7th, it uh, hung out at my old bar. Um, on the patio, we are just hanging out. It was a cold night. Uh, a homeless guy started to talk to my friend Brian. They were talking, and uh, I kind of dismissed him. You know, we were there for a couple hours. Um, my friend went home, and I said I'd walk home, as I always do. I ended up walking by Centennial Park, and uh, I fell. A guy came rushing out of the park. Um, to, to come check on me. I recognized the guy, it was the homeless man, um, you know, who stopped to talk to us a few times earlier in the evening. The guy asked, you know, started walking with me and I had my dog, I had my phone, I know where I'm going, I am five blocks from my house. Um, and I let him walk with me. I was approaching the underpass, so I have to go under uh, I-4 to get to my house. That was the first time where like uh, an alarm went off in my head. So I look at the guy and I say to him, this is it, like I got it from here. And at that point, something snapped. I had fallen, I had been crying cause I fell. And I did look like a mess. And he looked at me and he said, no one's gonna believe you. And he grabbed me. The man, um, pulls me to the ground, is grabbing everything. I'm screaming, um, I'm scratching. He continues to put his hand over my mouth and he takes his other hand and he puts it around my throat. At some point my, my pants are unbuttoned and then pretty much I only remember that. Um, I don't recall at all what transpired in between um, being choked. Someone slows down their car and opens the window and they uh, notify police that there's a girl in the road. And that created a little bit of a disconnect because when first responders um, approached the scene, they were under the impression that there was a drunk, crazy girl that was in the middle of the road flagging down people and trying to get in their cars. I was blessed that there was a, a police officer that showed up who knew me from working on 7th and uh, pretty much silenced everyone and, and said that he would take over um, and that if I said something happened, something happened. There was probably a moment where I may have walked home with my dog. If no one believed me, then did anything happen? Do I just go home? Do I go to urgent care and get my face stitched up? You know, do I have my fingernails scraped? Like, what happens? Um, I don't know the process. I was told if I leave the scene that I have no case. Do I want a case? You know, you're kind of faced with a lot of decisions to make at a really important integral time. When I got to, to the crisis center, I was immediately given an advocate and she walked me through a lot of things, like when I could speak or if I didn't feel comfortable saying something. Um, you know, explained further the process about, you know, going through and being interviewed again. The nurse 
you could tell she was meant for this position. Um, everything she did was out of love. My advocate started calling me immediately and, um, you know, offering um, to get me in to, to see my counselor um, as soon as possible. And there was no ifs, ands, or buts. It was just happening. It was just part of it. And you could tell that everyone else believes in the process so much that you just believed, you know, this is just the next step. Again, talking about being blessed, I, you know, I was given a counselor who helped me organize my thoughts and heard me talk about everything. The advocate sat next to me and humanized the situation. She asked me about my family. She asked me about the things that make me tick. She reminded me that from that very moment that I I'm not a victim, that I am Narashanaya, and that I will make it through, and reminded me of all the things that make me beautiful in a moment where I did not feel beautiful. And right from the beginning, you know, I got a tote bag full of information and resources and a blanket and a, and a journal and just the things that I would not have thought of as being as important to recovery as they were. I'm symbolic, but being handed the journal instead of like being told like to go get one um, was a beautiful gift. Everything was. Just the love that, that I felt in that situation where I don't have a mom anymore. My mom had already passed and like, the nurse like filled in like instantly it was like a surrogate mom like I felt loved the tools that they left me with um, helped me along my recovery um, setting me up with with counseling immediately um, advocates checking in I didn't have to keep track of anything that happened I didn't have to do the extra work I my energy was spent recovering and that was I feel again was a gift given to me by the crisis center a few months after um, the initial assault in uh, December, I was really just trying to tackle a lot of personal goals. I decided to run a 24-hour ultra marathon. It was the middle of the day, running on my track back home, so a block and a half from my house. All of a sudden, there are arms wrapped around me. I hear a neighbor come out of his house and scream, do you know this guy? And I look and it's a man that I don't recognize. The man then uh, proceeds to grope me in front of all of the people watching. This man literally was just driving in the opposite direction when I ran past him. He stopped his car and then just came up behind me. It was daytime. I was running and I was within a block from my house. It was the most surreal thing because this was only a few months after the first assault. I was then given back to the, the crisis center in that second assault situation. You know, I controlled the situation. You know, I called the advocate. I let other people know. And I, I probably would not have been as motivated or have the wherewithal to, to make those moves had I not gone through that previously. Had I not been shown the avenues for which to take. I don't know what my future holds. Um, tons of giving back tons of time with my family, uh, quality time, more races, more challenges, and yeah, my, my future's bright. I don't know what it holds, but the future's very bright. The future's very, very bright.